But now, it was this day last week that Brenda went out and met some members of the alopecia support group here in Ireland, and they were very open and very candid, and it touched a chord with many of you. Have a listen to this. This is 28-year-old Lisa telling Brenda about when she lost her hair. So what happened to you? When did you lose your hair? Um, in January 2010, the 1st of January, it was a great way to start the new year. <laughs> um, I was having dinner for my family and my sister came in and she said, Oh, Lisa, what you do is back your head? You've got a bald spot. And I thought she was messing with her having the crack. And uh, no, I had a bald spot. Basically, it was a tragic event that happened to a friend, very, very close friend of mine. And out of that, then I noticed the start of the alopecia had started and the spots had appeared in that. It's just a reaction to the stress of what I was going through is what I was told. Well, eventually, within a week, my hair was gone completely. It was there in threads and I just, I couldn't handle it anymore. So what I had left, I just shaved off. I'm no way vain, but I'm a girl. My hair is a big big deal. I just, I couldn't handle losing my hair. My mother and my sister, oh my God, it was just, they've cried with me for my hair. I'll bet they did. Anyway, Dr. Morris Collins, who's medical director with Hair Restoration Black Rock, is in studio with us today. Morris, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Really do appreciate it. Let's go to alopecia first of all. What is it? Remind people what it is. Al- alopecia just means the absence of hair and there are many, many causes of it. Um, but people refer to alopecia areata as alopecia, whereas men losing their hair is androgenetic alopecia. So there's lots of different terms, and there's a little confusion about that. Is there any difference? There is. Alopecia areata is uh, an autoimmune disease where the body doesn't recognize the hair and, if you like, rejects it. Now, thankfully for a lot of people who develop this condition, the little coin-shaped bald spot, the hair grows back, they may get one episode and that'll be it for the rest of their life, Mm -hmm. or they may get repeated episodes. Um, You can get a family history. It certainly can be precipitated by trauma and uh, stress. But very rarely it'll progress on to the very severe forms that um, are called alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis. So alopecia totalis presumably means it's all gone, there's nothing on your body at all. Is that right or does that just mean on your head? That's on your head. And then universal is the whole body? The whole body, everything. And even the tiny little downy hairs that everybody has on their skin, they, they disappear as well in universalis. And sadly, there's no cure for this condition at the moment. Um, there, there's huge amounts of research going on around the world in um, dermatological research laboratories but nobody to date has come up with a cure for it. Ariata can correct itself. If you like, <coughs> it's a spectrum. Ariata is with one single bald spot and that's it. That's the most one end of the spectrum and then you have universalis at, to- at the other end of the spectrum. It's an autoimmune condition. It's like rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. These are conditions that we don't fully understand why the body doesn't recognize itself. Now, I I was told uh, recently that you looked after a young guy who came into your um, clinic out there who was going bald. His mum brought him in and you corrected that problem. What did you do there? Um, there He was 14 and a half um, and his mother brought him in and he had a very, very strong family history of hair loss. His dad, in fact, was bald at the age of 19 and he was getting an awful lot of teasing and a hard time at school. So his mom brought him in just to see if there was something we could do to help. And he had the early uh, manifestation of male pattern hair loss, which he'd inherited from both sides of his family. So there are two medicines that actually help men with male pattern hair loss. One is a tablet called Finasteride, and the other is a a medicine that is applied to the scalp called Minoxidil. These are the only FDA-approved medicines, and we were able to start this young man on this condition, and it has stabilized his hair loss and reversed some of it. So he, the signs of balding that he had are gradually fading, but this is not a cure for him, unfortunately. It'll tide him through those vulnerable teen years and his early 20s, hopefully. But unfortunately, there is no cure for it. It's all about self-image. It's not about hair, really. I think, Derek, when you look in the mirror and you see that image in front of you, nobody else really sees that image. And if there isn't hair on the head, as you heard that young girl uh, speaking about who lost her hair, you don't recognize yourself.
It's fine. It, 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 it's all about an, a change in self-image, not really about the hair. Can you repair and everybody's hair? I'd only operate on about one in four people that I actually see in my clinic. Not everybody is suitable. And they must be very disappointed. So what do you suggest then? I've come, I've, I've plucked up the courage. I've got my few bob together. I come into consulting rooms. You have a look at me. Is it then you tell me, I'm sorry, I actually can't do anything because of A, B, and C? Or do you go with the process and then discover that it hasn't taken? We, we look after patients, not just their hair. And a doctor's obligation is to look after the whole patient. And if somebody has hair loss and they're not suitable for surgery, say their expectations are too high, they don't have enough donor hair at the back, there are many, many reasons why they may not be suitable. Then it's my job to be as, as understanding and as sympathetic to their needs as possible. One interesting thing, Derek, is that this service does not uh, exist anywhere else. It doesn't, it's not in the public health service. So if you have somebody who's been, say, badly burnt mm -hmm. in a fire and their part of their head is burnt and they are their eyebrows missing or their hair part of their hairline is missing, there's nothing in the public service to um, actually help these people. The plastic surgeons will do as best they can, but they can't replace an eyebrow, whereas we can. The HSE don't provide it, so if, if I have an accident, if it's not for aesthetics, mm. if something has happened to me, and I need this done. It's not out of, should I say, vanity. I'm, I'm doing it because... I, I, I have a young man. Um, I can't, I'm not going to even mention what county he comes from. But he got a ringworm when he was a child. And he was treated in the local hospital, misdiagnosed. And he's lost about 25% of the hair on the side of his head. And he combs and grooms it. Now, he's, in a, he's late teens. And this poor lad, his whole life is absolutely destroyed. Mm. And his whole, every, every minute of the day he's thinking about his hair, which is ludicrous. And there's nothing in the public service to look after that. So we're, we're trying to um, get some funding for him, and I've written letters to various ministers, etc., to try and get some funding to help him. But there's nothing there for him. my experience, um, a lot of family doctors haven't been trained in hair. In fact, when I decided to go into the specialty, I knew practically nothing about it, Derek, even though I was a fully qualified surgeon. And if anybody, say somebody, if my daughter had a problem with her hair, I'd take her to see a clinical dermatologist. Mm. These are uh, non-surgeons, physicians who specialize in skin problems. And they, they look after people with, say, alopecia areata. So, well then, Isn't that fascinating? So then when people come in to you, do you say to them, if there is enough donor hair, and presumably you know that by looking at their head, Yep. So you know, well, I, I can attempt this surgery. Okay. So it's a question of then, how am I going to help them get through it best? Do you say, you've got very good donor hair there. Now, I'm quite happy now. We can proceed with this. And I'm absolutely pretty much certain this is going to work for you. It depends on their expectations. And the consultation, when I was a, an ear, nose and throat surgeon, I, when I saw a new patient, it would take me roughly 20 minutes to make the diagnosis and recommend treatment. Our consultations with hair takes roughly an hour on it, virtually every patient. And what you're trying to do is, is tease out the expectations of what the patient wants, what they want to try and achieve. I, I remember one man years ago, um, he was a county council worker um, and he had saved up for nearly six months just for the consultation fee. And he was one of the boldest men I ever saw. And I remember his words distinctly. He wanted to look like Elvis. <laughs> He, he so thought, you brought him to the costume hire place around the corner. No, 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 no what happened? He, but, the poor man, he, you know, he, he really was genuine. He thought that <laughs> I was God and that I could perform a miracle and I could put new hair on his head. Brent, give me a glass of water. <laughs> a surgeon has said they're not God. <laughs> and he's the top <laughs> <laughs> you know that one, Derek, I'm sure you've heard it. What's the difference between God and the surgeon? I don't know. God knows he's not a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's take some calls. Uh, let's go to Damien. So w what is your own situation, Damien? Well, my situation is uh, I began going bald kind of late in life. I'm a 50-year-old man now, and I had my hair for most of my life, and then I suppose from about 37 on, I started to lose hair, and it gradually went... And I just got the remaining hair cut fairly tight. It didn't bother me too much. And then I, I, I was exercising one day in the park, and a lot of young lads were taunting me over my, my baldness. And I go to Spain quite a lot, and my, <laughs> my head gets very red and, and shiny over there. Mm -hmm. So it became more of an issue for me, funny enough, when I hit the 50 mark. 
and at that stage you start looking into uh, you know procedures and that and the concern I would have is that the back of my head might be scarred and I wear my hair quite short when I'm in Spain and that which you go to quite a lot so I was concerned about that Damien if I can address some of those issues there if you have um, a hair transplant carried out and you use the strip method to take out a large amount of hair from the back you can normally cut your hair back down to a blade 4 or blade 5 and the scar should not be visible. If you shave it completely, you're going to see the marks in the skin. Mm. Yeah. And just, just one final point there, Morris. Uh, Damien, just can I just give you w one little bit of advice? Don't rush into a hair transplant. Take your time. I I go and see as many people as you possibly can and discuss it with people whose opinion you trust. And there's a cliche which says if it appears to be too good to be true, it usually is. Well, Use your one, one final concern I had there, Morris, was... I know that the drugs that you give people there, I understand there could be a side effect of impotency from them. Is that right? Or? A, a, the finasteride medication can cause a reduction in sex drive in less than two men in a thousand. I see. So it's a very, very rare occurrence. I have a lot of young men who have developed, are developing hair loss. It's at an early stage. And by putting them on the medications, we were able to bring them through those vulnerable years. Unfortunately for men who have gone bald on top and have no hair there, just the horseshoe around the back and sides, then there's no point in taking the medicines for that. Every patient is different. Their hair is different, their scalp is different, their requirements are different, what they're trying to achieve. And when you look in the mirror every day, you have to recognize that man in the mirror. One of the issues that people have is that you're, you're 50 now, you sound like a young 50-year-old, and I'm sure inside your head you're no more than 25. And when that 25-year-old looks in the mirror and he sees a guy, not that looks like 50, but he actually looks like 60, well, then there's a big discontent there. And that's really why hair loss causes problems. On that subject, um, uh, is it true that bald men are more virile? Devil a bit. What do you think? I'm looking at this one of your. This is what I'm looking at one of your colleagues there, and he's grinning. Don't from stand too close to them; they make you pregnant. <laughs> you know what I mean? What is it? Is it true? No, there's no truth in that. No at all. truth in it at all. Yeah. The but testosterone levels have been done, and they're the very same in bald men as they are in men with hair. But I read somewhere that the castrati in Italy don't mm. go bald. Didn't go bald. That's right. They yeah. had testicles removed. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. So <coughs> remove your testicles and you won't go bald. Is, is that's that a radical approach. <laughs> well, that's, well, I'm offering I'm it down the back street. It'll be cheaper than going to you. Derek, um, I'm not going to go to your side. <laughs> no. Can I ask you, you know, lots of products on the market out there, and I won't mention any of them. They claim they can do this. They can make, make your hair stand 10 feet tall, you know, when you get up at 6 o'clock. <coughs> you know, your hair is stronger. You know, it's shinier. It's brighter. It's cleaner. It's able to talk faster. Not they can yeah. do everything, you know. As far as I'm concerned, there are two products that work, uh, finasteride for men, and incidentally, women do extremely well, some of them do extremely well with the product minoxidil, which is the active ingredient in Rogaine. Um, but any other product, and I'm not going to name them... Uh, Have you a vested interest in those two products you've just No, mentioned? absolutely not. All right. But, and you can buy them without... Rogaine, you can walk into your chemist and buy it without prescription. But... I challenge anybody who reads on this miracle cure, if they can find good science behind it um, in a peer-reviewed scientific journal to validate the claims that the people are making about it, then I leave my mobile number here in the studio and they can call me any time of the day or night. For instance, one of the gimmicks is a laser comb. People uh, talk about laser combs and... I lecture at the conferences, I attend the conferences, I read my journals, and I've never seen any good, substantive article to validate the claims that laser combs um, work in regrowing hair. Can you say that it doesn't they work? Just, they have a placebo effect, and that's all. When my hair is just receding a little bit at the sides and going back, and I was getting very worried about it at one stage, this is a few years ago, and Brendan, the barber in Donnybrook, beside Kylie's, told me, cut your hair short, and it won't be as noticeable, and you won't notice it as much, and people won't notice it as much, and he's dead right. Little trick of the trade. Absolutely, Derek. If you are, if your hair is dying... For men now, particularly, yeah. <coughs> and they wear it long it gets very wispy and it flies all over the place and over the years instead of developing a comb over like Prince From Charles from under your arm <laughs> <laughs> they, they cut it shorter and shorter and, and 
lots of men and in fact the very first piece of advice I give to men when I'm telling them about what to do is to consider cutting their short accepting their hair loss and getting on with their lives